Amen. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Saints of the Most High God. Welcome to another session of Bible study. And, you know, it's really nice to you look at the Word of God, get in the Word of God so that we can, you know, be more knowledgeable of saints, as saints and that we can really take the Word of God and apply it to our lives so that, you know, we can be the individuals that God wants us to be. You know, I'm just sitting in for Bishop Daly, and, you know, we just want to look at the Word of God and, you know, just allow the Lord to have his own way. So before we even look at the scriptures tonight, I'm just going to ask us to bow our heads as I pray. Lord, we want to give you thanks tonight for your love. We want to give you thanks for your mercies. We thank you, God, for life. We thank you for health. We thank you for strength. Lord Jesus, it comes time for Bible study, Lord Jesus. And this is manna, Lord God, from heaven, great God that will sustain your people. We look to you tonight, and we ask God that you intervene. We ask, great Jesus, that whatever is said tonight, that it will be according to your will. Let self be slain, and we pray, God, that the word of God will go forth and that it will accomplish that which you would have it to accomplish. We pray that lives will be changed. We pray, God, that individuals will be even more determined in their spirit, in their minds, to live to please you. We give you thanks, God, for what you will accomplish in this session tonight. And we give you thanks one more time. In the name of Jesus Christ, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. So let me take time out to welcome each and every person tonight. You're in Jamaica, you're in the U.S. of A., you're in Canada, wherever you are across the world. We greet you tonight in the name of Jesus Christ. And we welcome you to share in the word of God with us. And we pray, we believe that there is a blessing in store for you. But we believe that there is instruction in the word of God, you know, to tell you how is it that you should live your life according to the word of God. You know, like we've been saying, we've been talking from the book of Ephesians, we've been looking at identifying and overcoming the wiles of the devil. Identifying and overcoming the wiles of the devil. You know, if we are going to live a victorious Christian life, we have got to know the enemy, we have got to be able to identify the enemy, and we have got to understand the strategies and the things that he used to try to chip up the child of God. Ever so often, you will find that the adversary will come in and he will try to chip you up. And as people of God, we must be aware that there is an adversary, right? So we want to look tonight at our scripture. It's taken from Ephesians 6, from 6, from verses 10 through to 12. It says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that he may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And we really want to focus on verses 11. Like I said, you know, I... Like I said, I want to take my time and I want us to go through the scripture. I want to really approach it from a practical perspective. You know, so, so pointing out some things that happen you know, to us are some things that the devil wants to happen. And we want to point them out and we want to, us to be aware because um, 
it doesn't necessarily mean that we have to go through them, you know. But being aware of them means that we are able to identify and be able to apply the strategies and, and the know-how in order to overcome what the adversary is throwing at us. Because at the end of the day, we want to make sure that we hear from the Lord, well done, don't good and faithful servant. We don't want to hear depart from me. I know you not. I want to hear from God, well done, though good and faithful servant. In this passage, the apostle, we said from the last time that we met, the apostle started out, you know, by telling the folks how they should behave in this Christian warfare. We ask how many of us know or how many of us are aware that we are up against an adversary. How many of us are aware that there is a devil and the devil is real. We said last time that based on the fact that we receive the Holy Ghost and from that experience we know that God is real. We, therefore, we also know that the adversary is real. When we talk about there is an adversary, we are not talking about a figment of our imagination. We are not talking about something that we conceptualize and then we tell folks that, look here, there is an adversary that is trying to destroy your soul. We, we don't tell folks that so that they can be fearful and then come and serve God out of fear. No, but we want you to know that there is an adversary and this adversary is real and he is dear to destroy your soul. The Bible says in St. John 10, verses 10, and we look at the scripture last time, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. And we made the point that Jesus contrasts himself between him and the thief. So it's either Jesus or the thief, and the thief comes only but to steal, kill, and in the destroy. Jesus said, I come that you might have life, and have more abundantly. This thief that the Jesus was talking about is nobody else but the adversary. That is why he said, I come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. The Bible also said in 1 Peter 5 verses 8. So from the word of God, we deduce that there is an adversary. And as we get down into the study, we are going to look at the adversary. We are going to look at his first position. We are going to look at the things that he used to do in heaven. We are going to look at him coming on earth. We are going to uncover the adversary. So as we go through the lesson, I want us to pray much. Pray much for me, you know, that I find the mind of God. Pray much, you know, that the will of God be done. That we don't just want it to be something that, you know, persons can say, yes, I am edified. Yes, I have knowledge of who this adversary is but knowledge so that we can apply it to our lives. Knowledge so that we can deduce strategies so that our lives can be pleasing to the Lord and we are able to overcome what the adversary throws at us. So 1 Peter 5 verses 8 tells us, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is as a roaring lion seeking whom he may Devour. So make no mistakes about it, brethren. There is an adversary that is trying to destroy your soul. There is an adversary that at your very best you cannot defeat him. There is an adversary that is only the power of God, through the power of God that you are able to defeat this adversary. And guess what? He is not going to let up. This adversary that we're talking about, not a figment of our imagination, not something that we conceptualize to tell you to drive fear on you so that you can serve God. No, but this adversary that we are talking about is real. The Bible says in the scripture that we read, and we read last week from the New English translation, finally, my brethren, be strengthened in the Lord and in the strength of his power. We ask the question, um, what does it mean to be strong in the power of the Lord and, and, in, and in, are in his mighty power? 
the word strength and its derivative we said was used some 360 times in the Bible, applying to both natural strength and supernatural strength. The Greek word katiai means power, strength, might. In the Bible, strength is often linked to the power of God. Believers are to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. And we spent some time last week and we talked about this Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24. According to Jeremiah, we have, we have what we have, the strength that we have is not our own. Ultimately, it comes from God. Let not the wise boast of their wisdom are the strong boasts of their strength. But let the one who boasts boast about this, that they have the understanding to know that I am the Lord. What Jeremiah is saying that if you're wise, don't think that you're, you're wise all by yourself. If you're strong, you're not strong all by yourself. It is because of the Lord. You are strengthened by the Lord. So the word to be strong from the scripture actually means to be strengthened, right, as rendered in the New English translation. So as the apostle encouraged the believers, one of the things he reminded them of was that the Christian life means participation in a spiritual battle. Yes, verse 12 tells us, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. But I want us to also understand that as Christians, we cannot hide from this battle. We clearly stated it last week that there is no hiding place when it comes to this battle because the adversary is going to take the battle at your doorstep. You have got to recognize then that the only way that you can overcome is by the strength of the Lord, by relying on the strength of the Lord. That is why the apostle, when he started out and he began to tell folks how they should behave in this spiritual battle, he said that we should be strong in the Lord and in the power of the might, or we should be strengthened in the Lord by his mighty power. If as Christians we think that we are going to hide and that we are going to get a free pass and we are going to serve God and the adversary is going to give us a free pass so that we can get to heaven like that. I want us to know, brethren, that it's not going to work like that. You have got to fight the good fight of faith. The adversary is not going to relent. He is him is to destroy you. His number one purpose is to see you go to a hell that was designed for him. And he's not going to relent. He's not going to let up. But he is going to be at you. And if you think that you can hide, it will not work. The adversary is going to take the battle at your doorstep. So we made the point last week that there are two important things that we need to understand. And one is that to be strong in the Lord, it is not talking about our strength. As believers, we do not possess the strength, nor can we strengthen ourselves in the Lord. Rather, this empowerment, the strength that we receive, um, comes from God and this is what the Greek word that is used in the text indicate that the strength that we receive comes from a supernatural being and it comes from God. Uh, the Bible said it's not by might or by power but it's by my spirit and he said that to Zerubbabel and I would like us to know that it is going to take the strength of the Lord to really overcome the adversary. You and I cannot do it by ourselves as we get down in the lesson you are going to realize when we go into the book of psalms and psalms say that we were made a little bit lower than the angels and that is talking about who it is that we are up against if we were made a little bit 
lower than them, automatically we cannot overcome them. So it is going to be important then that we understand that in order to overcome the adversary, in order to overcome his minions that he sends against us, we have got to be strengthened in the Lord. The next important point that we pointed out that we should understand is the term in the Lord. The apostle could have said by the Lord, be strengthened by the Lord. He could have said um, be strengthened some other way. But he said that we should be strengthened in the Lord. We made the point last time that when our lives are positioned in the Lord, in union with him, in fellowship with him, in communion with him, that is the time we will possess the power to overcome the adversary. Let us not think, brethren, that we can live any and any way, and we clearly stated it last week. Let us not think that we can live any and any way. And then when it comes time to stand against the adversary, we think that we can just draw on the Lord like that and overcome the adversary. The apostle said that we should be strengthened in the Lord. If our lives are not in the Lord, then we will not be able to stand against the adversary. There isn't any two ways about it. So we have got to make sure, if we mean God, we have got to make sure that our lives are in the Lord. Our motives are in God. Our dreams and our aspirations are in God. Our will is submit to his will. Our direction is led by the Lord. The Bible says as many are led by the Spirit are his sons. We have got to make sure that everything as it pertains to our life are aligned and they are in the Lord if we are going to overcome. So we cannot live any and any way and think that you know, we are going to get the results when it comes to stand against the adversary. Like I said earlier on, that the adversary is going to take the battle at your doorstep. And if he takes the battle at your doorstep, brethren, I want you to understand that you have got to fight and you cannot fight with your own strength. You've got to fight leaning and resting or pulling on the strength of the Lord. We mentioned Samson, and we said that Samson was born in such a time, and God used Samson to, 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 to destroy the Philistine. But Samson took it for granted. And while he fell in love with this woman, the woman said to him, tell me what it is, the, where your strength comes from. And he said, Buy, buy me with some new ropes. And she did that. And he was able to get up and shake off. But there came a time when Samson poured out his heart. And they cut his locks. And when he got up this time to shake, there was no strength. Brethren, like I've been saying, we cannot just do what we want and then just get up and say, yes, I have the strength of the Lord. No, you'll find yourself in problem and you'll find yourself be held captive by the adversary. The believer's empowerment comes from being in Jesus Christ. Apart from him, we can do nothing. But in Christ we have at our disposal his empowerment, all the strength of his might through the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. The Lord powers power make us able and capable. He strengthens us with everything we need for any task. We can rely on the strength of the Lord and be victorious in any battle. We were on the last week, we finished on the point 
of resting on the strength of the Lord or pulling on the strength of the Lord. And we look at the scripture from 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel 14, 6 to 15. And Jonathan said to the young man that bear his armor, come and let us go over unto the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. As we look at the, word, the words of Jonathan, we recognize that I believe that Jonathan was one that could have used his sword and used it well. But even with all of that, Jonathan recognized that it was not about his strength. It was not about his ability. He said to his armor bearer, come, let us go, because preadventure the Lord might deliver them into our hands. We spoke about the story last week. Jonathan said to the young man, as we go up, if they said, come up, then the Lord would deliver them into our hands. And Jonathan and the armor bearer went up. And while they went up, the men said to him, come up. Let us show you a thing. These Israelites come out of the hole that they were. And it was Jonathan and his armor bearer against 20 men. And these two men kill the 20 enemies. And I want you to understand that it was not by Jonathan's strength. But because Jonathan said, the Lord don't have to save by few. Or he don't have to save by many. The Lord does what he please. And so Jonathan based upon leaning on the strength of the Lord. And I'm saying this and I want to emphasize it. That if we are going to overcome the adversary. If we are going to overcome the fiery dart. If we are going to overcome when the adversary throw things at us. The only way we are going to overcome is by resting on the Lord. Two men defeated 20 by identifying that is not because of their own strength. They defeated 20 by identifying that it's not anything pertaining to them, but it is of the Lord. I want, us, want to tell us that the strength that we possess tonight, the strength that we possess to overcome the adversary is not anything of ourselves. It is of the Lord. So the two men, depending on the strength of the Lord, took down 20. Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. When we are weak in ourselves, we are strong in the Lord because strength becomes evident. One of the things that I want us to know is that when we recognize or when we say to God, God, I have no more strength. That is the time the strength of the Lord becomes perfect. That is the strength, the time the strength of the Lord becomes operational in our lives. Too often as individuals, we try to run with the thing. We try to do everything within our power before we come to the point where we can say, Lord, it is not of me, but it's of you. And so it's important that we always try to have this mindset that when we approach things in life, when we approach the battle, that we understand that it's not of ourselves. His strength, the songwriter says, is perfect when our strength is gone. He will carry us when we can't carry on. So these two men, like we said, it was evident that these two men rest, they rely upon the strength of the Lord. The, their strength will, 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 will fail according to them. And they say that the Lord will deliver them into our hands. How many times is it that we 
face the battle, that we face our enemy. And before, and the last thing that we say is, Lord, your strength, take over. But it should be the first thing that we say, God, it's not anything that I possess, but it's because of you. So we want to turn now in our Bibles to the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 17. And we will look at 8 to 9, 33 to 37. So, this giant, I will know the story well. This giant came out for 40 days of glory. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said, Why are you come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine, and his servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you, and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me, and to kill me, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then... Shall he be our servants and serve us? Can you imagine a giant coming and saying for a number of days, for 40 days, send me a man that we can fight. Send me a man that we can fight. When a champion starts asking for a champion, it automatically eliminates the foot soldier. Oh, glory to God. When a champion starts asking for a champion, it automatically eliminates the foot soldier. When the adversary is coming against you, he, he is not carrying any foot soldier, he's not carrying any minions, he's going to come against you. But just by the word of this giant, just by these words, send me a man that I could, that we can fight. It drove fear into the armies of Israel. Even the king was fearful. These were people of God. And one man stood up to defy the army. And he said, if I be able, and that person kill me, then we will serve you. But if I kill him, it, you will serve us. That alone is a huge responsibility for one man to go down there. And when you look at the man, that man was so big, he was so tall. His spear was heavy, his sword was heavy, his shield was heavy. Oh, Jesus. And that man stood to defy the army of God. It drew fear in the hearts of the valiant men of Israel. There were some warriors there in Israel at that time, you know. Those men that were around King Saul who, who, who were warriors. It drew fear in their hearts. So every man, including the king of Israel, was afraid. But here came this lad and said, I am willing to face this champion. So the king said to David, I want us to listen to the words of the king. You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. For thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. Saul said to David, you are not able. You see, if David went and 
was not resting upon the strength of the Lord. Just by this statement alone, David's mind would have changed. Because the king of Israel, the adversary, using the king of Israel to put doubt, sprinkle a little doubt on David's feet. And many times we face the adversary. Sometimes it's through the person that is closest to us. Just sprinkle a little bit of doubt on the things that the Lord has laid in your spirit. Just a little bit of doubt. And because you're resting on your own strength, you're not even realize that, look here, the adversary is using that person that is close to you. If David was not resting upon the strength of the Lord, then this statement from Saul would have caused David to turn his back and say, no, I cannot face the giant. 1 Samuel 17, 34. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him, and smote him, and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he rose up against me, I caught him by his beard, and smote him, and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be of one of them, seeing that he had defied the armies of the Lord. Let me tell you something. We need to value our experience. I didn't even plan to say this, but let me just follow the leading of the Spirit. We are to value our experiences. When we look at our past victories, we know that under God we can have future victories. When we look at the battles that he fought for us, then we know that he will fight for us in the future. When we look at the past victories, we know that presently God can work out a victory for us. David, Saul, tried to sprinkle doubt on David's faith. But David then drew back on his experience. And he told the king that, look here, I was keeping the sheep. A bear came, a lion came. And I was able to destroy them. I was able to kill them and deliver the lamb. And based upon this experience, his faith now was at the point where he said that this uncircumcised Philistine shall be of one of, as one of these. Verse 37. David said, moreover, and this is where we recognize, oh Jesus Christ, where David's strength came from. This is where we recognize who David attributed his victory to. He said, moreover, the Lord, oh glory, that delivered me out of the power of the lion. So he recognized, David recognized that this victory that he had over the lion and over the beer was not anything of his own strength. He said, the Lord that delivered me out of the power of the lion and out of the power of the beer, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, I want you to listen to the word of the king. Go and the Lord be with thee. To me, this was a little bit sarcastic. Surely a king would not believe that this lad would be able to fight against this man that was a warrior from his youth. So in sarcasm, I believe that the king was saying, go 
and the Lord be with thee. Because in the back of his mind, he was saying, this lad is just going out there to sacrifice himself. But David had faith. David knew the victories that he had under God. And he was saying, the same God that delivered me out of the lion, out of the bear, is the same God that is going to give me the victory over this. Philistine. So we're looking now at 1 Samuel 17, 45 and 46. While David went to the battleground, there was a conversation between the giant and David. David testified where his strength came from. 1 Samuel 17, 45 and 46. Then David said to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword, and with a spear, and with a shield. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee, and take thy head from thee, and I will give the carcass of the host of the Philistine this day unto the fowls of the year, and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. So even when David was victorious and they were saying that Saul had slain his thousand and David is ten thousand, in David, David's statements was clear. It was not anything of him. It was of God. David said, the Lord will deliver you into my hands. He not only spoke by faith, but he rested on the strength of Jesus. Sometimes we are going to come up on Goliath. The devil is going to come in like a flood and he's going to be like a Goliath. Yes, in our lives, he's going to be like a Goliath. And sometimes when one thing happens and next thing happens and you're saying, God, what is this? Ah, the, the, the adversary is going to come in like a Goliath. And he's going to talk. And if you are not careful, if you are not in the Lord, fear will come upon you. Fear will distract you. But when you rest upon the strength of the Lord, when you know where your strength comes from, my strength is in the Lord. No matter how strong we think we are, this flesh is weak. And you can look for that. You can write down Mark 14, verses 38. Left on our own devices, we will fall into temptation and fail in any worthy endeavor. Left by ourselves, we will fail. Even when it comes to any worthy endeavors, left by ourselves, we will fail. The weakness we inherit in this human nature is why the Bible commends us to strengthen, commands us to strengthen ourselves in the Lord. Christ's power is made perfect in our weakness. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. As we learn to rely on God's strength, instead of our own, we gain new heights. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like hinds feet, the feet of deer. He enabled me to tread on heights. Friend, it's not about anything that we possess. It's not about who you know. If we are going to be victorious over the adversary, 
if we are going to achieve the things that God has set out for us to achieve, if we are going to live a life pleasing, holy, acceptable in the sight of the Lord, the only way we are going to do that is by recognizing that it is not about me. It is all about him. It's by recognizing that my strength is, will fail. And when my strength fails, that is the time his strength becomes perfect. I want us to know tonight that you will not have the victory if you rely on your strength. The battle is a spiritual battle. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers and against rulers. We, recognize, we, rec we wrestle against foes that are much stronger than us. So we have got to rely on the strength of the Lord. The strength to overcome this enemy is not of ourselves, it, nor can it be of ourselves. Because this is a spiritual battle. The strength to be victorious in this battle comes from the Lord. It comes when we are rooted and grounded in him. Anytime we are not in the Lord, we can be easily ambushed. Anytime we are not in the Lord, we can be easily overtaken by the enemy of our souls. Anytime we are not in the Lord, we can be easily held captive. The adversary can just come upon us and overtake us. And I we are talking a lot about the ad, but look here, I'm not giving the adversary any credit more than what he deserves, you know. But I want us to understand that there are many folks who were in God, folks that preach, folks that teach, folks that know the Bible back and front. And this same adversary, oh God, is able to capture such a one and hold them captive. And sometimes, if it's not for divine intervention, they can't get free. From the adversary holding them captive. God has to purpose himself and say this one. No this one. I have to go back in the enemy's camp for this one. But persons who are powerful. Persons who preach and teach the word. This same adversary is able to draw them out. And I want my brethren tonight. You are watching. I want you tonight to know. To know that it is of the Lord. The only way you are going to overcome is by drawing your strength from the Lord. So if you are not in the Lord, you can be easily ambushed. You can be easily overtaken and the adversary will hold you hostage. So the apostle said in dealing with the enemy that we must be strengthened in the Lord. It is not of your own strength, nor is it of mine. But it is of the Lord. In him we live. In him we move. In him we have our being. In him we have the victory. It is not outside of the Lord, but it is in the Lord. Any man be in Christ is a new creature. Old things are passed away and all things are become new. So if you outside of Christ, you were feeling and you were, you, you were feeling in God is a new thing. God has never lost a battle. Even when he went on the cross and it seems like it was all over. God has a way of turning what the adversary meant for evil to accomplish his own will. When the adversary said, yes. I get him now. Jesus Christ was just ready to go snatch the keys of death, hell, and the grave. And he rose again to give us the victory. It is because he lives why we can face tomorrow. 
it is because we live, he lived, and we can rest upon his strength to be victorious over the adversary. In him we live, in him we move, in him we have our being. And I want us to get the point that the, ad, the, that the apostle in starting out to tell us how we should behave in this battle, he said that we should be strengthened in the Lord and in the power of his mind. And it is very important as we move forward, I want us to bear this in mind, that the strength, the willpower, everything that we need to overcome the adversary, that it can only come to fruition when we rest upon the strength of the Lord. So we mentioned in our introduction last week that there are the different, different things that we want to look at as we go through the lesson. Um, it's also important that we understand what the apostle is saying to us about the enemy. Very important now. So let us look back at the scripture um, taken from Ephesians chapter 6. Verses 12, and we can look at everything. So he continued, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And in verse 11, he said, put on the whole armor of God that he might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Just going to pause here for a bit because it is when we put on the whole armor of God that is the time we are going to be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. We have had lessons, Bible studies, about the armor of the Lord and putting on the armor of the Lord. As I'm just going to breeze over it. But as we look at verse 12, as we look at verse 12, it says, For we wrestle. So further down, we are going to look at the armor. Just, just, a, just a brief overview of the armor. But as we go to verse 12, it says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So in verses 11, he said, that we should put on the whole armor of God that we might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. He then continued in verse 12. And he began to give us an insight. Into who the enemy is. So he said, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So he tells us that this battle, this this wrestling, this war that we are in, it is not against flesh and blood. Virgin, many times we think that that person next door have it for us. But it's not the person next door that have it for us. It is the adversary that is trying to get us. So he said, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers and against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Before we go any further, we need to look at two things. One, who am I? And two, who is the enemy? Very important, if you are going to be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, you have got to know your enemy. This is why internationally, and if you don't know that there are spies even today, I want to tell you that there are spies even today. And spies will leave their house for months, for years. 
And they can't even tell the person closest to them where they are going. And they will go to another man's country. They will go to the enemy's country. And they will live amongst the enemy. Study the enemy. With one aim. And that is to defeat the enemy. I want us to understand. That if we fail to study our enemy. Our enemy is not failing to study us. The adversary knows your move. He knows what to put in your way. To get your attention. Because he spends the time to study you. And it's something that we have to understand. If we do not study our enemy. If we do not know our enemy. Then we cannot have the victory over the enemy. So clearly there is an enemy. And we establish that. And the apostle clearly stated that the enemy is not flesh and blood. But it is a spiritual enemy. Whoever I... Put it to us that as children of the living God. That in order to truly understand the enemy. Who he is. And what he is about. You must know who you are. And this is very important. In order to understand the enemy. In order to identify the enemy. In order to know the enemy. In order to know the wiles and the devices of the enemy, you have first got to know yourself. In our introduction, we quoted from the script, The Art of War. We said, if you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not to fear the result of a hundred battles. And this is true with God. If you know yourselves and you know the enemy under God, you do not need to fear the result of any battle. Because God is on your side and he is going to fight for you. The Bible said that the battle is the Lord and he will fight for you and he has never lost a battle. So if you know your enemy and know yourselves, you don't need to be fearful about the outcome of the battle. Especially if the Lord is on your side. The statement is true if the Lord is on your side. On the other hand, if you neither know the enemy nor know yourself, you will succumb in every battle. You cannot win a battle if you don't know yourself. You cannot win a battle if you don't know the enemy. This is true. If you don't know yourself, you will never win. Our beliefs and what we stand for, then we will not be able to identify the enemy. So in other words, if you know your belief, if you know what you are about. If you know the things that you hold dear to your heart and the principles that you stand on. Based upon that you will be able to identify the enemy. But if you're not sure of the principles. If you're not sure of who you are. If you're not sure of your beliefs. Then you will not be able to identify the enemy. Not being able to identify the enemy means certain death. Why? The enemy might, might be at your doorstep and you not know that it is your enemy. Anytime you allow the enemy to get so close to you, it is certain death. Not being able to identify the enemy means that you can be ambushed at any time. You can just be on your merry way and because you don't know yourself, you don't know the enemy, the enemy can ambush you at any time.
not being able to identify the enemy means that the enemy can easily infiltrate your camp and take you hostage. You might think that. The enemy is far from me. Not realizing that the enemy is sitting next to you. You might think that the enemy is over yonder. Not recognizing that the enemy is the one that is cooking your next meal. If you are not able to identify your enemy, the enemy can easily infiltrate your camp and he can take you hostage. And it's when you are held hostage, that is the time you know that that is the enemy. But when you know yourself, when you know yourself and know what you believe, know what you stand for, you will be able to easily identify the enemy. This is because there is a line that is drawn. When you know yourself, you will know the enemy because there is a line that is drawn. And this line tells me that anything on the other side is the enemy. And I am not talking about another individual being on the other side. I am not talking about somebody that is unsafe and on the other side. Because this is a spiritual battle. So anything that is not of God is on the other side and that is my enemy. So I am not talking about an individual. Because this battle is not about flesh and blood. It is against principalities and it is against power. When I know myself and I draw that line, anything that is on the other side of that line, I know that that is the enemy. Anything that is anti-Jesus is the enemy. Because on this side of the line where I am, I am saying Jesus. I'm saying that Jesus save, Jesus keep, Jesus satisfy. But anything that is anti-Jesus is on the other side of the line. And that is my enemy. So because I have standards and I have values and I have belief and I have drawn my line. I know that on that side stands the enemy. Hallelujah. And dare not put him foot over this side because I have a sword of the spirit that anything push them on over this side. If you push him on over there, drop off. Because the sword of the spirit is wheeling, which is the word of God. So anything that is anti-Jesus is on the other side. And that is the enemy. Anything that is anti-truth is on the other side. And that is the enemy. Oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. Anything that is untruth, lies. On the other side. The spirit of lies. On the other side. And that is the enemy because my line is drawn. Anything that is anti-righteousness. Oh, glory to God. Is on the other side. Because now are, am I the righteousness of God. And being the righteousness of God, I'm going to try everything to be righteous as God would have me righteous. So if it is anti-righteousness, it's on the other side of the line. And I don't want anything to do with it. And I am easily able to identify the enemy because the enemy is on the other side. Anything that is anti-peace, Jesus said, my peace I give to you. Anything that is anti-peace, you can't be a Christian and it's be a war and war and war in your house. You have to be of peace. Anytime you find that there is war and war and animosity and chaos in, you, in your house, you have to take check. There is the enemy that is in there and the enemy is anti-peace. And you have got to be able to identify the enemy. Identify, I, I always talk this thing. 
or bless God as it pertains to marriage. I always start this thing. I remember years ago when, when I was wondering what is happening in my relationship. And it was when the Holy Ghost drew me aside and said, look here, the adversary is trying to mash it up. The adversary is trying to infiltrate it. And because I was pressing, I was pressing, I was able to identify that the enemy is trying to come in. If you're not pressing somebody, you will not be able to identify when the enemy is coming. The enemy is going to come in like a flood and he's going to overtake you if you're not pressing towards the mark of the high calling of God. You have got to be in the Lord. So anything that is anti-peace, my peace I give to you. You can't be a child of God and, 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 and you can't cry peace. Even when the enemy is riding the person that is next to you, my peace I give to you. Jesus, you should be able to cry peace. You, the, the, the righteousness of God, you which is representing God, should be able to say to that person, peace. And I'm not even talking about rebuking them and saying, peace be still in the name of Jesus Christ. I'm saying that you should be able to cry peace. And out of a situation where the adversary is turning somebody against you, you as a child of God should be able to turn that situation. Talk to God about that situation and have peace in it. So you watch yourself. If at work you are thinking that, people is against you and there is no peace your neighbor you come you leave work and you come home and you realize that your neighbor is against you and you're saying that there's no peace at, at, at school somebody's against your child and you're saying that everywhere you turn there is no peace watch yourself and be able to identify that the enemy is trying to get you and he's going to get you if he's anti-peace. You need to make sure that the line is drawn and make sure that you know that the adversary is trying to remove the peace. Jesus said, my peace I give to you. Anything that is a fear and doubt, the Bible says that God has not given us a spirit of fear but a spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. The Bible said God has given every man a measure of faith. Anything that is of fear and is of doubt, it is not of God. And you need to recognize that there is a line that is drawn. And when God gives you a word and God said, this is what you're supposed to do. Anytime doubt come, anytime fear come, you understand that the adversary is at work. And because he's on the other side of that line, you are able to identify that the adversary is at work. You have got to be able to know who you are, know what you're about. Draw that line. It might sound harsh, but I am drawing that line. Because anything on that side is the adversary. Anything that is anti the word of God. Come on somebody. Anything that is anti the word of God. I am going to draw the line. By this I live. Hallelujah. By this I live. My steps is ordered by the word of the Lord. My steps is ordered by the word of the Lord. My life is governed by the word of God. So anything that is anti the word of God, that is the enemy. As we get down in the lesson, we are going to recognize that many times the adversaries try to distort the word. When we get the word of God, the adversary will come to us and tell us that not so. God didn't really mean that. That is what he did to Eve. And look at where mankind is now. I want you to understand that if you don't know yourself, you will not know the enemy. The enemy will be right beside you. The enemy will overtake you. The enemy will hold you hostage. If you do not know yourself, nor you do not know the enemy, it is therefore important that we look into ourselves. 
look at what we are about. We can reshape our presuppositions. Reshape it in God. The Bible says any man being a new Christ is a, in Christ is a new creature. We can reshape the way how we think. Reshape our beliefs and get ourselves to the point where we are aligned in God. And know that, look here, my line is drawn. And because my line is drawn, oh bless the name of Jesus Christ. The enemy is on that side. Anything that is anti my belief. Anything that is anti-truth, anti-Christ, anti-peace, anything that is not according to the will of God, it is the enemy. Oh Lord Jesus, I don't know how some people, as it pertains to the will of God, just go ahead and do anything. If, 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 if it's the least little thing for me, sometimes uh, it might look like, to my wife that I'm worrying about the thing but it's not really worrying but I just want to make sure I can just imagine how God feel to know that as a man I want to make sure that I'm in his will I want to make sure that I'm in the will of God by living for him so you got to know who you are you got to know what you're about. You got to know what you believe. And in doing so, then you will be able to identify the enemy. My question, therefore, then tonight is who are you? Very important that we look in ourselves right now and that we answer that question who are you we're on the topic identifying and overcoming the wiles of the devil and we are saying that it is important that you know the enemy but in order to know the enemy you have first got to know yourself you have first got to know your belief know what it is that you're what is it that you're about know what is over on the other side and you're not going to touch the things that is on the other side. But the question that I need you to answer tonight is who are you? I want you to soak a little bit as you think about if we were having a one-to-one -one conversation and and let's say you don't even know me, but you're having a one-to-one -one conversation with somebody, you just meet them, and they say, who are you? What is the first thing that you will tell them? Would you tell them that um, I'm Everton Bailey, and I have a, a doctoral degree in this, or I am about this, I'm a business owner? What would you tell them? In my response, my first thing that I would say, who are you? I would say, I am a child of God. It doesn't matter who thinks what. And I would say that without any regard of if someone hears what they will say about me. My first response, your first response should be, I am a child of God. Who are you? What is your identity? I am a child of God. Everything else comes after that. On the interview, who are you? I am a child of God. Everything else comes after that. Once you have fulfilled the plan of salvation, you have repented of your sins, you have been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of those sins, you have received the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the initial evidence of speaking in an unknown tongue. You are trying your best to live a life that is holy. Then you are 
a child of God. You are a born again believer. You are a son of God. Once you have fulfilled the plan of salvation, you are a child. It doesn't matter who you were. It doesn't matter where you come from. In your community, there could be zinc fence upon zinc fence. The guns could be barking. The people could be illiterate. But as for you, if you have accepted the plan of salvation, you are a child of God. And being a child of God, that must stand for something. Being a child of God means that you are identified with God. It means then that the principles, the statutes of God must be the same principles and statutes that govern your life. If you say that you are a child of God, then anything that is the principle of God, anything that is the statue of God, that is what should govern your life. And anybody comes around you know that you are a child of God because these are the principles and the statutes that you use to govern your life. So it doesn't matter where you are from. You are a child of God. And I feel like to say if you can't read or you can't read. You are a child of God. You are a son of God. The Bible says in St. John 1, 12 to 13. We are going to turn to this scripture. St. John 1, 12 and 13. I want you to know that know that you are in Christ. Know that you have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And you have fulfilled the plan of salvation. You are a child. You are a son of God. The Bible says, St. John 1, 12 and 13. But as many as receive him, to them gave he power. You cannot become a son of God just normal like that. And call yourself the son of God. No. The Bible says you must receive the power from God in order to become a son of God. That is why the Bible tells us, but he shall receive power. And you must fulfill the entire plan of salvation. The God that we serve is a powerful God. is a powerhouse. And his sons are supposed to be powerhouse. And that is why God put power in us through the Holy Ghost. So it is going to take power from God for us to become the son. So he said, but as many that has received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Even to them that believe on his name, which are born. Because some folks will tell you, you know, that once you believe on Jesus, once you believe on his name, then you are saved. But even this passage goes down to tell us that those who are born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So in order to be a son of God, you must be born of God. And be born of God you means that you fulfill the plan of salvation. Galatians 4, verses 7. I want somebody to understand tonight who they are. It's time that you stop. Let the adversary put in doubt in your mind about who you are. If he gets in the mind and being able to plant doubt in the mind about who you are, then you will not stand up. Uh, and the principles and the statutes of God, your, 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 your guard will be let down and you will accept what the adversary is putting at you if you allow him to put doubt in your mind about who you are. Then that line that's supposed to be drawn is going to be faded. Hallelujah. And the adversary 
will be able to push his thing against you. And in church, Holy Ghost, you can identify that even some of the lines for saints have been faded away just by how they attire themselves. Just by how they attire themselves. You find that the line is faded away because the adversary casts doubt in their mind about who they are. When you see a child of God doing the things of the world, when you see a child of God that is not satisfied with their complexion, they are not satisfied with the hair, they are not satisfied with the nails, you understand that the adversary is pushing things. And that the line, this line that should be drawn to say anything that is over on that side is the enemy, is fading. Galatians 4, verse 7. I want you to know tonight that you are a son of God. When the adversary tries to put doubt in your mind about who you really are, you need to rebuke him in the name of Jesus Christ and say, I am a son of God. If you just, let me tell you something. If you, you mean to live for God and you broke your toe, and you get up and brush off yourself. Even when the adversaries come and say because you chip up. You're not a son of God. Tell the adversaries no. I have repented of my sins. And I am willing to follow Jesus. I am willing to walk and follow Jesus. I buck my toe. You don't see when I repent. But you're coming. He's an accuser of the virgin. And I want you to tell him. Because he will tell you in your mind. He will tell you things in your mind. And I want you to say no. I am a child of God. It's just a mistake. Wherefore, Galatians 4, verse 7, Thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if son, then an heir of God through Christ. As a son and an heir of God, you inherit all the blessings of God through Jesus Christ, which include hurtly and heavenly possession. I want you to understand tonight that you need not to give up this that Jesus Christ has called you to because you are an heir of God. You are a child of God and being a child of God, you are an heir of God. It means that you are an heir to the earthly possession. You are an heir to the heavenly possession. Being a son, you have a status that you are an heir of God. In Romans 8, 8 verses 17, Paul says, No, if he are children, then he are heirs of God and co heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. I want you to know somebody that you are not an ordinary person. Being a child of God. Fulfilling the plan of salvation as is laid out in the scripture. You are not an ordinary person. You are an heir of God. What does here mean? It means... That you are in a position with God... According to 1 Peter 1 verses 4, as his children, we have an inheritance. Being an here, you have an inheritance that can never perish. It can never spoil. It can never fade away. Jesus said, do not store your treasures on earth where thieves can come in. But he said, store your treasures in heaven where thieves can go, where moth will not take it up, where it will not rotten. So being an heir of God, being a child of God, you are an heir. And being a heir means that you have an inheritance to receive of God. Because you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ has made you son. 
He has made you a son. We have full rights to receive his inheritance. You have full right to receive his inheritance. We are his beneficiaries. So if we carry this thing to the physical, my sons are my heirs. So if I make a will and I put my son's name on that will, each of them go and get something. And I pass off. They will get it because they are my heirs. Now, Jesus Christ has died for us. And because of Jesus Christ's death, we are joint heirs with Christ. Which means that God will not die. But God will give us the heavenly gifts. He will give us the earthly gifts because we are heirs of him. Other scriptures that you can look on for that is Matthew chapter 25, verses 34. Galatians 3, verses 29. And Colossians 1, verses 12. And Colossians 3, verses 24. All these scriptures, they talk about us being hearers of God and joint ears with Christ. As a child of God, you are no ordinary person. And if the adversary can get you to think that you are ordinary, if the adversary can get you to think that you are of no use, you, are, you serve no purpose, then he would have already defeated you. Who are you as we go through this, through this question tonight, identifying us, identifying us as children of God? What would your answer be? Who are you? Who am I? I am a new creature. 2 Corinthians 5 verses 17. I am a new creature. Who are you? I am a new creature in Christ. The things I used to do, I do them no more. The places I used to go, I go them no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. And behold, all things are become new. So Paul here wrote that Christ's death for sin has changed the way he regards people. Instead of looking at them, looking at each individual as a mere human being, Paul said, I view those who are in Christ as something entirely different. Those who are in Christ are those who are born again and is living a holy life. Those who are born again are those in Christ who have become something they were not before. I can testify to us that Jesus is real. The saying goes that if you had known me before I knew him, then you would understand why I love him. You would understand why I serve him. But I have come to know that any man being Christ, who am I? I am not the one I was. Any man being in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away and all things are become new. In fact, those who are born again in Christ, who have become something they were not, their identity has changed from being a fallen version of themselves. Their desires have changed 
to being associated with the righteousness of Christ. So when you accepted Jesus and you are now changed, you become something that you were not. In fact, the old man is gone and the new man has come. All the old dreams, the ideas, the old agendas, the purpose have ceased to exist and have been replaced by Christ's ideas and agenda. That should be replaced by Christ's ideas and agendas and purpose. So if you have been serving God for a period of time and find yourself Keep on going back to some of the things that you used to do and that you know you should not do. You need to check yourself. If I find myself going back to some of the things that I used to do, then I need to check myself because something is wrong. That line that I have drawn would have been faded away over time and the adversary would now have me to be doing things this old man would now be rising up against my beliefs and my principles. If you have been serving God and after two years, after three years, you're still desiring the things of this world, something is wrong. Love not the world, the Bible said, neither the things of the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And I'm not going to sit here and tell you. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that it is easy to totally shed the old man and the old lifestyle. I remember that every other word that used to come out of my mouth was an expletive. And it came to the point after I received the Holy Ghost and I was trying to live for God. Really trying because this was something new. The Holy Ghost experience was new. I went to a friend's house and the dog rushed down on me. Expletive came out of my mouth. Young Christian, few months old, but because I was trying to shed the young man, the, the, the old man, trying to shed the old man, and even up to this day, some of us been saved for 20 years, and God is still working on us. God is trying to bring us to a place of perfection. We cannot be totally perfect while we are on earth, but God is trying to bring us to a place where we can completely, where we can totally shed this old man. So I am not going to sit here and behave as if I am perfect. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that it is easy to overcome. But I'm going to tell you though that if you make up your mind, I'm going to tell you that if you are determined to live for God, you are determined to walk in the newness of life. I am going to tell you that you will be able to under God. Again, it is not about you, but again, God will give you the strength to travel the journey. But it will not be easy, and I'm not going to tell you that it is easy. But you have got to be determined. You have got to have a made up mind to say that, yes, Lord, I am going to walk in the ways of this new man. Yes, it is going to be challenging at times. And at times I might trip up. And at times I might fall. I'm going to get up back though because I am a new creature. I am definitely changed. My life belongs to Jesus. I'm not the one I was. My life has been rearranged. Who are you tonight? Hallelujah. Who are you tonight? Who are you tonight?
tonight as we wrap up, I want to leave us with this question. Who are you? If you are not able to identify who you are, you will not be able to identify the enemy. The enemy will come in and he will sup with you. And you are not able to identify that that is the enemy. And before you know it, you are held captive by the enemy. And it's only divine intervention that is going to free you up from the shackles. Only divine intervention is going to free you up from the chains that the adversary used to bone you. I challenge us tonight that we know who we are and we know whose we are. If you know who you are and you say that you are a child of God, if the first thing that comes out of your mouth is to say that you are a child of God, then your life must be aligned with the principles and the statutes of God. God bless us tonight as we go throughout the week. I want us to contemplate who we are. When we come next time, we will do a recap as usual. And then we will continue this who I am. And I'm going to point out some things to us about who you are as a child of God. And then we will get into who the enemy is. If we are able to identify ourselves, know who we are, then we are going to be able to easily identify the enemy. God bless you tonight. Thank you for streaming. And may the Lord make his face to shine upon you. Let us just bow our heads. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for what was said. We pray, God, that you would edify your people, God, that you would stir them, Lord Jesus Christ. God, bring all of us to the point, O oh Lord Jesus, where we recognize that we are first sons of God. We thank you, God, for using this vessel tonight. We pray, God, that you will have your own way as we go through the rest of the week. Help us to contemplate the question, who am I? And help our lives, Lord Jesus, to give the answer. Let the answer not be verbal, but let our lives give the answer. We give you thanks tonight for hearing. Bless your people, strengthen your people, keep your people. Those who are in fierce battle, God, against the adversary. We ask, God, that you intervene on their behalf. And that you will help them to rely on you. Help them to rest upon your strength and give them the victory. We give you thanks right now for hearing and answering in the name of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you one more time. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, in Jesus' name.